The Long Box Crusade presents Fan Bill Fridays. Welcome to Fan Film Fridays. I am your host, Clinton Robinson, recording down here at the LBC basement for what may be the very last time. That's right, folks. I was buried under a mountain of paperwork. Quite literally, uh, Jared stored his old tax forms down here, and they kind of fell over, <laughs> and I'd been calling for help for weeks. That's, that's why there hasn't been an episode. But thankfully, Sean Ross happened to be at LBC HQ, heard my cries for help, and came down here, rescued me. We're on our way out. But I also promised you listeners something special for us reaching 35 Longbox Crusade patrons. And those Crusaders Club votes, they came through, folks. So before Sean and I exit, we're going to discuss a very special fan film. One that um, might take us a little bit. So, I mean, th this is like a dream, Sean. Th this is a dream come <laughs> true. So, before we get into all this, I have to ask you, do you have any experience with the Sandman? Yeah, man. Well, one, it's great to see you. I'm so glad I was, was down at uh, Longbox headquarters. I was dropping off some cheese for Pat, and uh, I heard some muffled cries, and I just assumed... You know, I didn't. I didn't know what was going on, and I and I thought, well, okay, and and then I I peeked my head and saw you buried, and I'm glad I was able to free you. But I, I do have a lot of experience with Sandman, so I loved like many comic book collectors. It's one of my all time favorite series. Uh, you know, I go back to issue number eight. Actually, was my first issue of that comic. Oh, I think I. Oh what yeah, a great one to get in on. Oh my god. So so actually, I used to go to a comic book store in Phoenix. It's, it's closed, and, and on a good note, it closed because the owners retired. It didn't close you know, for bad reasons, but still sad because I had gone to the store since I was 10 years old, maybe nine. But either way, I went all the way through my into my late 40s. So I, I literally grew up in the store, and the, the owners had known me my whole life and everything. So they had uh, an employee that worked in there who I knew really, really well. She was awesome. She was a great, you know, uh, person and I would sit there and chat comic books with her forever. And so she had tried to get me to buy Sandman. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Man, I've never heard of this writer and the, the art's kind of weird. And I'm not really, I don't know, I'm not a horror comic guy. And she's like, just, I'm telling you, it's really good. It's really good. It's really good. And I was like, well, whatever. whatever. And so finally, the the sound of her wings, that issue, you know, issue, I think that's issue eight, right? The, the yeah. first appearance yeah. of death. That issue comes out, and that cover is gorgeous. And she goes, look, she goes, I'm not letting you leave the store until you read this issue. She's like, I've been telling you, you're not listening to me. You have to read this. And so I read the issue in the store, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is mind-blowing. This is the greatest thing I've ever read. I, I cannot believe I skipped the first seven issues. I'm such an idiot. I'm never going to be able to afford them because everybody's going to realize how good this comic is. And she goes behind the counter and pulls out issues one through seven for my pool box. And she goes, I know you're an idiot. I knew you would want them. I saved them for you. And so, which is like the best comic book store person of all time, right? So I bought one through eight right there and then took them home, devoured them, and then have been collecting the book ever since. So I love the series. I love Gaiman. It, because of Sandman, I read Good Omens by by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. It's one of my favorite novels. And then I, you know, followed him. You know, I read Black Orchid. I read basically everything he's ever written. I've got, I've gone to see him speak several times. I have you know signed copies of of all of his novels. I just am you know he's an amazing author. 
I love the Sandman universe. And then the extension of it too, right? To Wesley Dodds and Justice Society and, you know, and then Jack Kirby's Sandman and just all the different places it touched. Weirdly, Infinity Inc., which is still bizarre <laughs> to this day. But it is, yeah, it is. It's one of my all-time favorite series. I think it's, it's an untouchable series. It's amazing. And even, and I want to give a big shout out because I think about this all the time and I never say it. There's a spin off. There was a million spin off series from it, but one in particular in the late 90s, Lucifer by Mike Carey and Peter Krauss, is a 75 issue series. It's one story for 75 issues, but you don't know it's one story until you kind of get towards the end of it. It is, in my opinion, not on par with Sandman, but it's as damn close as you can get. So if, if anybody's a big Sandman fan and hasn't read the Mike Carey Lucifer book, I highly recommend it. Totally self-contained, just like Sandman, you know, goes 75 issues and tells just an, an unbelievable story. And it's not quite the same as the TV show that... No, based no. On the the TV show is based comic. on the early issues of it, and then it, but it doesn't have... No, no, there's no way. This, this is way too nuanced a story, and it's, but it's phenomenal. It really is. It's one of my favorite, like, kind of stealth Vertigo books, and it's, it's so good. And it's a really great companion to Sandman. Okay, so uh, anybody who knows you, listens to you know your podcast and stuff, they're going to know that you are also a huge Dr. Destiny fan. I do love Dr. Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> you say that jokingly, but you and I talked about Justice League of America Annual 1, which is the JLA, the satellite era JLA versus Dr. Destiny in his t full Skeletor you know, blue robes, and <laughs> and I love him. I think he's an awesome villain. I mean, Gaiman oh, he's makes absolutely him. one of my favorites. Don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. I love him. But. Gaiman makes him horrifying, like terrifying. But I still love old school Skeletor Dr. Destiny, too. I think he's a lot of fun. Okay, so with that out of the way, folks, we'll let you know that if you haven't looked at the show notes... Sean and I are going to look at a little film called Sandman 24-Hour Diner. It is a fan film from the folks at Morpheus Dream, which I can only assume they use that title specifically for this. Mm -hmm. It was posted to YouTube back in 2017 and currently sports a scant 137,000 views. All I can assume is that people are just as afraid of this story as I am. Yeah. Be because, I mean, the, the story in the comics itself is terrifying if you haven't actually read it, folks. But come on, Internet, get your crap together. <sighs> so, Sandman 24-Hour Diner is a live-action fan film created by Evan Henderson and Nicholas Brown, the culmination of a passion project three years in the making. It was filmed in Toronto, Canada, and first released worldwide, June 26th, 2017. That kind of works out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. It does. Peek behind the curtain, folks. Sean and I are recording on June 26th, 2022. <laughs> it works out. That's scary. It's, it's dreamlike. Yeah, it almost makes it seem like it's not real. I know. Okay. So the film stars, and get ready for me to butcher some names in here, folks, because <laughs> I always do. David John Phillips as the narrator, Francis Stayek Townsend as Bet, Story Saris as Judy, Zach McKendrick as Dr. D, Kenton Blythe as Mark, Justina Bocanat. Oh, good lord, I, I cannot say that. Spelled B O C H A N Y S Z as Kate, Doran Damon as Gary. Neil Affleck, no relation to Ben Affleck, as Marsh. Michael Sutherland, no relation to Kiefer Sutherland, as... Or Duke Ruth and Darren. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I don't know, he might be related to... Yeah, you never know. Yeah. They know everybody. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, Michael Sutherland as the kids show host, Ben Lefevre as Morpheus, and Ken Lashley as the voice of the Corinthian. The film was self-funded with a budget of $65,000. Good lord, that is a lot of money, folks. It is to me, anyway. Yeah. Uh, Pre-production began in late October of 2014. The script was written by Evan Henderson and Nicholas Brown, adapted straight from the original panels of the comic, with the intention to adapt it as faithfully as possible 
as a proof of concept for a television series. And guess what? The Sandman is getting a television series on Netflix coming out later this year, mm -hmm. and it has absolutely no connection to these. <laughs> well, you know, maybe they planted the seeds. <laughs> As this was a fan film developed outside of the studio without the rights, the filmmakers self-funded the production over the course of three years and released it online for free with no chance of monetization. <sighs> okay, so a few notes before we get into this. The inclusion of the animated sequence further into the movie was done to give the original story more of a climax to feature Dream and his abilities, who only appears in the final pages of the issue. This allowed the filmmakers to open up the world of the Dreaming and the potential of blending live action with animated scenes, similar to Fantasia. Yes, I'm reading from the Wikipedia notes. <laughs> the original storyboards were created by artist Colton Fox, and animated by Anthony Francisco Shepard. Comic book illustrator Ken Lashley, as we mentioned before, contributed the image of Morpheus for the opening credits. He also has a voice, as, voice cameo as the Corinthian, as we said. Principal photography began on April 17th, 2015, and was completed in four nights of filming. It was filmed on location at Ted's Restaurant in Scarborough, Toronto. So all of you sightseers, <laughs> stop by Ted's Restaurant and tell them you do not want the Dr. D special. No, no. All righty, folks. So this film runs just over 30 minutes. So be prepared to set aside part of your day for this one. However, I assure you watching this ahead of our discussion will be highly valuable. Sean and I will spoil literally everything that happens in this film because there is not going to be much holding back. And, you know, there will be all kinds of fun discussions along the way. Uh, one major caveat, though. This film is very different from what is normally covered on this podcast. Yeah. It is definitely NSFW. It means not safe for work. There is a lot of adult language, adult situations... And things that may very well be triggers for some of you out there. Nobody on the LBC network will think less of you for opting out of this one, folks. It is very heavy. But with that said, if you do choose to continue, the link is in the show notes. So I am going to take a quick moment to play the trailer, which is pretty much just an instrumental. So you'll maybe I should link the trailer to you too before you... Yeah. The trailer will be in the show notes too, so maybe you can judge for yourself if you want to continue. So if you do, uh, go ahead and watch it. Come back and join us, and we will see you on the other side. Everybody back? Good. Okay, this is a long one, so get ready to listen to me a lot. And I am mostly stealing this from a, uh, a wiki page, because thank goodness they did the summary a whole lot better than I could have. At a 24-hour diner, John D. observes the regular patrons. Bette Monroe is a writer masquerading as a waitress, or perhaps the other way around. Judy is a young lesbian girl of whom many locals do not approve. Gary and Kate Fletcher are rumored to have married because he was after her money. But Bette can see that they are truly in love. Bette has been having an affair with a man named Marsh. Marsh's wife, Marsha, died of alcoholism. A young man named Mark doesn't yet know anybody there. In his second hour there, 
D is forced to use the ruby he stole from Dream to prevent any of the patrons from leaving. Mark realizes he's late for a meeting, but as he gets up to leave, he suddenly changes his mind inexplicably and orders another coffee. Judy Curl <clears throat> Judy calls her girlfriend Donna's place, but ends up getting her mother. Donna's mother doesn't approve of their relationship and hangs up on Judy. In hour four, D watches a children's program where he influences the host to tell the children that they should slash their wrists, slashing his own on camera. When the television program goes off the air, D bursts out laughing. In hour five, the patrons begin to get restless. Gary realizes that they've been there for far longer than they meant to be, but he can't bring himself to leave. In hour six, Judy writes a letter to Donna, apologizing for hitting her. Meanwhile, Gary still can't fully form his thoughts. In hour seven, D makes them see what they desire most. Mark wants to be an executive director with lots of money. Gary has a $20 hooker in the back of a convertible. After beating her up, he'll drive off. Kate dreams of killing Gary, knowing that he'll never have the chance to cheat on her again. In hour eight, he moves among them experiencing their little joys and minor pleasures. But he soon realizes he'll get no enjoyment, no entertainment from these simple pleasures. In hour nine, he sparks conflict with Marsh fighting Judy for her sexual orientation. In hour 10, he makes them love. In hour 11, the news reports indicate that people seem to be going mad all over the planet. In hour 12, he has them reveal something about themselves. Kate tells the story of how, when she was 18, she got drunk and wandered into a funeral home. She found her way into the mortuary, where the corpse of a young man was laid out on the table. Seeing him excited her, and she went over to the body and began to play with it. Eventually, she had sex with the body. Sex with her husband Gary has never been as exciting for her as that time was. In hour 13, D forces them to have an orgy. In hour 14, he demands that they tell his future. They claim that he will die soon. He demands a different future, and they claim instead that he will become all-powerful and usurp the place of the Lord of Dreams. In hour 15, he lets them have their minds back for just a short while. In hour 16, he has one of them murdered in the dark. In hour 17... Marsh confesses that Marsha had known about his affair with Bette and what drove her to alcoholism. As he confesses this, he hammers nails into his hand. Furthermore, he confesses that he met Bette's estranged son in prison where the young man was passed around between the inmates for the price of one pack of cigarettes, which Marsh says he also did. In Hour 18, D refers them to primal beings, forcing Gary and Mark to fight for leadership. Gary tears out the young man's throat with his teeth. Hour 19, he lies to them. By Hour 20, Bette has sliced off some of her companion's limbs with a knife. Afterward, the ladies have a sing-along at the cafe's bar counter. Hour 21, he convinces Judy to attempt a religious experience by gouging out her own eyes. By hour 22, they are all dead, save for Dr. D. Hour 23, Dr. D ponders a fly in his hand before eating it. In the 24th hour, Dream arrives. D, however, is not convinced that the new arrival will provide him with much entertainment. And in a later sequence, suggesting a future episode to which we never get to see. We are teased with a segment featuring the Corinthian, eliminating two potential muggers. And that, folks, is the bare bones summation of Sandman 24-Hour Diner. I'm going to go wash my brain. <laughs> okay, Sean, I'm just going to say the first time I... Before even watching the fan film, when I read the story the first time in the Sandman comics, the, yeah, I, I'm like you. I, I kind of think this thing broke my brain a little bit. Yeah, it is the scariest comic I've ever read to this day. And and it is the – I God. So you know, I told the story of how I picked up one through eight and went home and read them. There are still panels in 
though that run of comics that to this day stick into my head. I mean, I can see from issue four the the battle with the demon in Helm when you know Morpheus says, "I am hope." You know, for what is you know what is hell worth if there's not a hope in hell? And I can see so many. And but the the in particular the 24 hours that issue, the images of of the men fighting as animals for dominance, and it says the women huddled with each other for protection. That image is burned into my brain. And they did a great job of, of recapturing. Well, I know we'll talk about this in more detail, but they did a great job of recapturing some of those images. And then the the moment of him uh, marsh nailing the the nail into his hand and i mean there are just so many specific images that are so disturbing so many bits of dialogue that are so disturbing from this issue i mean it really is it was the moment when i mean i actually for me issue four is the moment where you realized oh this guy's a genius with gaiman and then six comes along and you're like oh my god but and then eight you know uh, comes along and it's you realize he's much more than just a horror writer, but it is it is such an incredible issue, and it's so dark and it's so disturbing. And I, you know, it's one of my favorite comics of all time, and it's a comic I don't return to very often. So, I, you know, I think there's a reason for that. Yeah, you're saying issue four is the moment you realized Gaiman was pretty much a genius. That's the moment where you, if I if I'm remembering the right issues, is, is that the moment where you you actually feel compassion for Doctor D? A little bit, yeah. Issue four is the one where he where he has the the battle in hell with the demon, mm-hmm. and and where they're you know he's like I am a bug, I am a virus, and you know they're going back and forth. And but yeah, no, there is that there is the the drive to the diner, yeah, with the nurse in the car, and she's you know really scared, and and he's got a gun, and you think you know eventually she's kind of talking to him and befriends him, and she's gives him a coat, and you're like oh my gosh, you know a little kindness and compassion. And then he just shoots her, and you're like, "Oh shoot!" Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, like he, act, you know, he's he just keeps telling her, like, "I just want, you know, just drop me off here. It'll be okay." Mm-hmm. And the whole time she's been telling him, "I've got a family, a, you know, a husband, a kids," and and when he when she drops him off, and she's actually like, you know, feeling relief, and he's just like, you know, that story, yeah, you know, what you were telling me. Do you really have a family? She's like, "No, I'm not even married." And he's like, "I thought not, you lying bitch," and just yeah. It's and crazy. Yeah, that's you know that's like one of those epic heel turn moments, and it's like oh, you, mm-hmm. like I remember reading it and just like throwing the book down and like curse you, Neil Gaiman, you made yeah. me, you know, you made me so sympathetic for Doctor D because he's he gives this whole huge story about how you know how he realizes he's insane and mm-hmm. and everything, and he just he just wants a normal life, and then next thing you know, he just like nah, screw that, I'll just ah. It is. It's. It's. And the art is. You know. It's. It's. Um, Malcolm Drin, Drinberg and. Um, or wait. Shoot. It's now. Well, now I'm blanking. I just had it in my head. It's <laughs> Drinberg is the artist I know, and then um, the inker eventually actually takes over. Um, let me pull this up. Sorry. Oh, Mike Drinberg. Sorry. Mike Drinberg is the artist, and so and he's eventually takes over. Um, he does the the first like six issues of the book, and then his inker takes over at a certain point too. But the art is so unbelievably dark and just it's so disturbing. It really is. It's it's incredible because Doctor Destiny is so creepy looking. Yeah, he's he's distorted looking. Yeah, I mean, but it's, it's like it's, the I'm gonna say it once so everybody can get it out of the way. The Materia Opticon. <laughs> you know, the you know, dreams gym yeah it, it's like it has physically warped him and that's yeah you know i mean i know that's like the in in continuity explanation for the the skull face anyway but it, it's and gotta think this also comes around the same time as the um arkham asylum mm-hmm. graphic novel where dr destiny is also depicted in that distorted look yeah it's really a, a brilliant touch by drinberg and malcolm jones the third is his inker and jones becomes the penciler of the book later on but the two of them the art is so dark and, and robbie bush is the colorist the art is so literally dark and then topically dark as well mm-hmm. and yeah and the way they draw him i mean he's like half he's emaciated and he's this really sickly gray and his hair is kind of 
spindly and his teeth are you know falling out and rotting and mm-hmm. I mean it's very it's corporeally disturbing and then what he's doing is so mentally and emotionally disturbing and and I have to say in the fan film they do a brilliant job of casting people actors who look like the characters in the mm-hmm. story the one place they just couldn't get for me was in Dr. Destiny. It's not that the actor doesn't do a good job and it's not even that his makeup isn't effective. I, I don't think it's um, I don't think it's badly done at all. It's Zach McKendrick is the actor. I think he does a good job and I think the the way they you know they do what they can, but I think this is the difference between comic books and movies sometimes, right? Is mm-hmm. that it's so much more horrific in the comic where in the movie you can kind of see I don't know the wig or you can kind of, it just, it pulls yeah. me out a little bit. He's, he's definitely the the place where I'm not as connected in the movie. Yeah. Um, his, his look in the fan film kind of reminds me more of the clown from spawn. That's what I was thinking too. The violator. Yeah. I mean, not like, not the exaggerated proportions, but the hair, especially, you know, how it's like the bald spots in the middle and mm-hmm. sticking out on the sides. But I mean, it, his performance, though, more than makes up for the lack of look. No, he does a good job. Yeah, he, he acts very well. It's just the part that kills me is he looks like the law professor who kills his wife in an episode of Law and Order. <laughs> you know, like it just it's like every episode of Law and Order. And so that's such part a nice like, old man. He fed all the neighborhood <laughs> cats. Exactly. And uh, and I just can't I couldn't connect with him. But oh, my God, everybody else, especially I have to say Kate in particular it has a very specific look in the comic, which is like the short cropped black hair, mm-hmm. the black leather jacket with all the buttons on it. And it, I mean, it was like, oh my God, they captured her completely. And then they they did such a good job with Mark as well, where he just looks like this jerk. Yuppie. Yeah, he, he looks like every frat boy you ever yep. you know, despised in your yes. college days. Yeah, every every jerk frat boy who turns out to, you know, get yep. a great job from his dad and and is just you know this horribly abusive husband and but i mean it really it's eerie how well they cast this this movie and how much the people look like the the characters in the comic because then when they and they're very loyal when they recreate some of the panels i mean directly recreate the panels you know like the one where the three women are acting as oracles. Yes. And Donna has her jacket open and her breasts are exposed. That literally, I was like, oh, I remember that panel specifically mm-hmm. and the chorus of voices because they're basically telling him, like, you're going to die. You're not going to win. You're going to die. You're not going to win. And then finally he pushes them and they're like, oh, you're going to get everything you ever wanted. You know, you're going to get every dream you can imagine. I mean, and it's it's literally lifted right out of the book. So I do appreciate their their loyalty to the comic. Mm-hmm. And I think it's awesome. I think it's, it's commendable. Uh, I don't know. I don't know overall if it works as well as it should have, uh, you know, and, and I, and I mean, again, it's really good. It's really well acted, really well cast, really well narrated. Everything's good in it. I just don't think you can compare to what your imagination does. Right. With that comic, you know? <clears throat> right. Um, like you said, I mean, everything is spot on. It's it's like the panels themselves were literally put into motion in front of you. Uh, but just a few little things were changed here and there. But yeah, I mean, the, don't get me wrong, folks. This this move, this fan film is pretty horrifying. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like this has been on my to watch list for a long time, and I've just been putting it off because the original story freaks me out so much. Yeah. And to be honest, like, I mean, I really went into it with like, Oh my God, am I going to have nightmares from this? And it is. And I do, I do think your warning is correct to, to viewers because it does not pull any punches. No, and there are a couple scenes bit. in particular, the one where Kate is wants is going to have an ecstatic religious experience and she basically – she does an Oedipus, and she jabs her own eyes out. Mm-hmm. And you know they show her you know, kind of sitting there. They show her talking. They show her with the things in her hands. And then they, they imply the violence. And you're like, oh, okay. And then they cut away, and then they cut back to it. And you're like, oh, no, they're going to fully show us. Like they're not going to pull away from this yeah. at all. So, And I mean like uh, they do very much show you the, the nails in Marsha's hand, mm-hmm. the – 
Dr. Destiny eating the finger, mm-hmm. which is really gross. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, I'll tell you. So, so I think, I think what's interesting is to kind of do a comparative to the comic and the movie in some ways, I think psychologically the comic is more successful because it, your imagination fills in a lot of the gaps and you place yourself in there where in the movie, I was less likely to place myself in the movie, but a couple places where the movie was more successful. The other line I had never forgotten from this comic was when the kids show host, he has the hand puppet and the hand puppet yeah. whispers Remember in his kids, ear down the road, not across the street. Oh my God. The hand puppet, when the hand puppet's like, everyone's going to die. And you're like, okay, that was creepy. And then he whispers again and he says, you know what? We all need to kill ourselves. And he says, remember cut down, not across. And I, that stuck with me for so many years, how disturbing that scene is in the comic. And they actually make it more disturbing in the movie because the guy starts cutting into the puppet that he has on his hand. Mm -hmm. And there's something about how viscerally the knife goes through the puppet and it's implied then is you know going through his hand with the same force that that really that stuck with me in the film. So I think that was a, I mean it's hard to say more successful. Like oh it's a more successful depiction of a horrific suicide mm-hmm. child TV host show host. But but it it really is. That's a scene where I think they get it more right. Uh, I, I liked that a lot. What about you? What are some scenes that are are more effective for you in one or the other? Oh okay. god. Okay. Um. Jeez. Okay. When when. Uh... Kate tells the story about the corpse. Yeah. That, I mean, first of all, that is some seriously messed up stuff to yes. be reading. Oh, yeah. And then, but when she acts it out, I mean, the, the actress, God bless her, she held it together and made it very believable that, like, she was going to be getting turned on about just telling the story. Yeah, it's, I. so I will say the story works better for me in the comic because it's so outlandish mm-hmm. that it reads better on the page than it does necessarily being given verbally. But the line in that moment that works better for me in the movie and that kills me, she delivers it brilliantly, is she finishes the story and then she says, I don't want to be telling you this. I don't want to tell anybody this. Mm-hmm. And, and like a little bit of her breaks through. And that was so well acted that I was like, oh, that's haunting. Like – like he's left her enough of her own consciousness that she's telling the story, but she's fighting against yeah. herself telling it the whole time. Yeah, because he's feeding off of her shame. Yeah, yeah, and it, oh man, it, it's powerful, folks. It mm-hmm. really is, and not necessarily in a you know good way. But <laughs> no, I mean, but it does capture the it does, and, and I and I have to say for anybody who's listening to this, who's like, oh, this is just gross, but gross out porn, or this is just horror porn. You have to also remember the context of this. This was the late 80s. You know, this was the British wave, right, of, of mm-hmm. authors in comics of Morrison and Moore and Gaiman and Delano and Milligan. I mean, this was literally, you know, the, the British new wave, which in, in many ways saved comics, right? It, it forced started comics to take themselves and their topics oh, yeah. much more seriously. There are people who have never read another single comic, not even in the newspaper who have read every single issue of Sandman. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I mean and it's hilarious because you would have things like Swamp Thing 21, the anatomy lesson, which is one of the most famous single issues of a comic ever by Alan Moore and Stephen, you know, Bissett and John Toddlebean next to like Dial H for Hero. And you know, it was just such a weird era in comics. And so, you know, the, the British invasion comes and we start getting Animal Man by Morrison and Shade by Milligan and Sandman and Black Orchid, all these amazing comics. And so what may feel in 2022 like bridges too far, you know, in the horror element were very new and very, very just unheard of and uncommon in the late 80s. And they're all coming out of this very repressed like Thatcher era England that and you see that a lot in the Hellblazer book in particular. Mm -hmm. But you can feel it. You can feel the sort of repression of the late 80s. And the the idea of like style over substance, image over everything, and this is re- very much a rebellion against that because it's like, well, here's this all American diner in the middle of you know the country, mm-hmm. and all these all American folks, including our waitress, you know, who's supposed to be this this bastion of hope and and optimism, and when you peel back the layers, everybody has you know some sort of. I mean, they don't all have dark secrets, but 
every one of them has something. Yeah. And so, so for me, you have to kind of understand the context of it. And then the other part of it is this, this comic book is successful because it's balanced in the run by so many other styles and so many other types of writing. And that's the beauty of Sandman, right? Is it's so multi-genre mm -hmm. where if the entire Sandman book were just like issues one through six, it would not be as fondly remembered. And I don't know that I would have continued collecting it long term because horror books just don't do it for me. But it's, I mean, it's Gaiman's ability to break out of that and do, you know, so much more than just horror that that makes it really worth reading. So I don't, I don't know, as a standalone movie, how are you digesting it? Uh, I like it on the concept of being a, well, ugh. it works better as, Assuming it's an episode of a TV series, yes. yeah, which is what because they because you really do kind of need. Really, you you need to have read Sandman to kind of really know what's going on, because otherwise you're going to be thrown in here with Doctor Destiny and his his gym and all that, and you really don't know what what the context is. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know the, the little stinger at the end, you know, with the Corinthian is just a tease for like a future episode that doesn't happen. So, I mean, if this were going to be a, a movie unto itself, I would take the teaser out and maybe add like another 10, 15 minutes of exposition ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I have to imagine for somebody who hasn't read Sandman, this would be really disturbing and confusing even more so, but, mm -hmm. but also part of me is like, well, who's watching this? Who hasn't read Sandman, you know? Right. Like part, you know, part of me is like, I think it's a pretty safe assumption that anybody who was drawn to this and who stays with the movie after it gets really dark is doing so because they've read the book. And so uh, it's it is it's I really would like to have seen this show. It's going to be interesting when the Netflix show hits and they cover this episode. I wonder who's going to do it better because it's going to be hard to do it better than this. Yeah, because I mean, this is like we've said, frame like frame perfect. Mm -hmm. It is a direct adaptation. And, well, it does it even count as an adaptation if it's direct. Well, I, I say that there are slight changes here and there. Um, Marsh encountering Bet's son in the comic. Uh, he's, he says that he picked him up in Gotham City on a street corner. Oh, he does? Yeah. Okay. I thought he said he had him in jail twice, too. I thought there was a – I remember that vividly. And then mm. He doesn't say that in the, in the um, movie. Though I do love – the scene between Bet and Marsh where he says to her, and I, I, this is one I had forgotten, actually, when he says to her, you know, the reason she started drinking, my Marsha, his wife, mm. the reason she started drinking is because she knew about us having this long-term affair. And he says, and I just, I hated her. He said, I, I've never hated anybody as much in my life. I've never loved anybody as much in my life. And I hated her. And it's like, oh, that's really very interesting. And then he says, I blew an entire paycheck on two crates of vodka on New Year's, I left him in the house, and then I left town for a week. I came back, and she was already dying. And I was like, "Oh my God, that might be the most horrific line in the in the comic and in the movie." Yeah, I mean, it's Marsh is a horrible person. He's horrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most of them. The probably the closest one to an overall innocent in this is. Um, oh shoot. The poor kid just waiting for a yeah. job interview. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, I was like, he's just here for a job interview, and he's nervous as all get out. And the poor kid's drinking like cup after cup of coffee. So of course, you know, he's going to be extra jittery. Yeah, he's he doesn't have any sort of deep sin he's hiding. And oh man, it is yeah, it is yeah. troubling. Uh, so so something else I want to draw attention to is the animation. Holy hell, that is well done. Yeah, like they they're. A good portion of that budget must have gone to that because mm -hmm. that is like I, I mean I, I'm going to date myself here, but that's like Aeon Flux level amazing. I just I was blown away by it. I watched that section again and again and again because and and, and I have to tell you I have a question for you based on the quality of that section. Do you kind of wish the whole thing had been animated? Ooh, that huh, that's one of those. Uh, short answer, huh, yes with an if, long answer, no with a but. <laughs> yeah. Kind of one of those, like, yes, if we could have gotten an entire series out yes. of it. Yes, yeah, that, oh my God. I, I, would, I would slap down my Netflix subscription money right then 
just for a, a full, you know, 10, 12 episode series, just that animation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they, in, they incorporated, you know, several of the endless. Yeah. And they connected it to the overall DC universe because he goes through one of Superman's dreams. Yeah. Which is awesome because, and people forget this, the first you know, seven, eight issues of Sandman take place in the DC universe. He sees John Constantine. He interacts with, with John Jones, the Martian mm -hmm. Manhunter and his dreams. I mean, it, 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 you know, it was firmly rooted in the DC universe. Well, and Dr. Destiny was a JLA villain. Right. And, uh, there, like you mentioned earlier, there's the connection to Wesley Dodd's, uh, Sandman mystery theater. Yep. You know, there's even the, the overall special, uh, like one shot where mm -hmm. it's, it's a Wesley Dodd story about this cult that has Morpheus trapped in the basement. Yeah, which ties to Sandman number one. So, yeah, it's very, uh, it's it's really rooted in DC in the very beginning, which I loved. I thought that was really cool. And, and they did kind of need to break away from that for Sandman to reach its full apex. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would love a, a fully animated version. But I have to say the touch of the animation in this was just chef's kiss. Like, mm -hmm. it's my favorite part of the of the movie it's so well done okay and we haven't even mentioned you know the the appearance of dream himself yeah dude looks like morpheus dude yeah that is the most straight out of the comics yeah look i have ever yes. seen and yeah. i mean this is like 20 years of going to conventions you know all the movies everything i like no the, there is probably no topping this and the dude is on screen for like 30 seconds. Yeah, he d he is he does not have a role at all because it's supposed to be, you know, one episode in a in a series mm -hmm. and yet he is I mean, he's Morpheus come to life. It's yeah. not even Yeah. I I, I I I froze the the video on that frame and I was like, "Oh my god. Like they really nailed this. This is unbelievable." Yeah. I mean, no no lines, no no nothing. He just stands there with that look. And if you've Red Sandman, you know what I'm talking about. It's, mm -hmm. it's that look that he has. And it's, it's, it's not a blank look. It's not a vacant expression. But there's no there's no emotion, and there's tons of emotion in it. Yes, once, yeah. And you cannot describe it. Yeah, it's completely devoid, and yet it is tragic and dangerous and judgmental. And, yeah, and he nails it. I mean, he is – it's shocking. He is the spitting image of it. So, I mean, so they really get – this is such a well done film. I mean, there's, they get so much, and in fact, they get all of it right. Where it, you know, maybe falls t a tiny bit short for me, if I'm being unfair, is it's, you know, it has to be compared to the comic. And so the comic for me is more powerful. Mm -hmm. If I'm judging it only as a fan film, it's the best fan film I've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, th this is, God, I mean, th th this almost, it it's hard to, call this one a fan film because it's so much of a direct representation of what the comic is yeah but it's uh, amazing it's it yeah. is and so i have a question for you were, yeah. were you a big fan of the sandman book i have enjoyed what i have read of it i have mm -hmm. not actually read the entire thing i'm afraid okay so you know I, i'm one of those people that you know my my budget said uh you can't buy 20 graphic novels at once. <laughs> and I have lapsed along the way because, you know, over time, different different versions go out of print and get re-released. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, you're not always sure which one picks up where you left off. Sometimes they overlap. But, you know, th thankfully, um, well, unfortunately, that's Sandman's not on the DC app because it's a Vertigo book. Well, and also because it's a huge seller. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it is available in most libraries. Most libraries, if you do Hoopla, most libraries have all of the trades. Uh, it's it's a pretty standard. It, it's probably the most standard graphic novel set mm -hmm. in public libraries. So for anybody who's looking for it, it's it's and it's fantastic. So do you have a favorite Sandman story that you have read? Uh, yeah, you mentioned it earlier. It's Sandman number eight, Sound of the yeah. Wings. Because I mean, full disclosure, even years ago that. That one panel. Yep. And you know exactly which one I'm talking about. You know, it has gotten me through so much in life. Yeah. You get what everyone gets, Bernie. You get a lifetime. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that she's she's collecting the dead, and one of the says, one of them says, "But I got so little time. Why didn't I get more time?" And the yeah, she, that, that's a that's one of the best lines ever written. You get what everyone gets. You got a lifetime. It's so it's it's yeah. That issue is amazing. I I just I think about how astounding that series is because it starts out as a straight horror comic. I mean, even the ads. I don't know if you remember the ad. It was Morpheus with his hand out, and it says, "I will show you fear in a handful of dust." Yes. And the first six issues of that book are straight. Alan Moore style horror. And then you get, or the first seven, I should say, and then you get the sound of her wings, which is just beautiful. And then you get the doll's house is the next big arc. And that's a horror arc. That's right out of like Hellblazer. It's, it's a, it's a serial killer convention. And that's where you meet the Corinthian. But in the middle of that arc, you get a one shot about his relationship with Hob Galding, who is a man who lives forever because Morpheus basically makes a bet and the the man and he visits him every year to see if how if, if Hab has had enough of life and wants to die, and he doesn't. Hob Galding is always like no, even even at his worst, even when things are the like most horrific you could imagine, he's like no, I want to see what happens next. I want to see what happens next, and and that that single issue is one of the best things ever written. It's it justifies the entire medium of comics. It's so good, and it and it shows you this glimpse between that and the sound of her wings. It shows you this glimpse of what that book's going to become. Because eventually Gaiman breaks away from doing a horror title and he does a whatever genre strikes my fancy title and it works so brilliantly. Because the next arc after after Doll's House is Dream Country and that is just these one-offs, these brilliant one-off stories. In fact, we covered it. A group of us do a, a Halloween crossover every year. It's um, Married with Comics, it's Warlord Thanos podcast, so it's Al Sedano, and it's John and Maggie, and then Rick and, and Jeff uh, unpacking the Power of Power Pack, and Tim Price joins us too. And we covered Dream Country, we covered those issues, and, and it one year, and it was brilliant. So, And then you just get into like Seasons of Mist, the Lucifer one, which is probably the greatest arc of all time, and it's unbelievable how brilliant that book is, and you can revisit it because it goes so many different places, you can revisit it really frequently and find new stuff in it all the time. It's just it's it's shocking how great it is. I can't I'm staggered by his his talent and and what he was able to do in that medium. And you know, and I part of me wishes he had done more in comics, but also I don't know, you write Sandman, what's gonna you know, how do you top that? <laughs> yeah. I mean that that's like saying, well, William Shakespeare, you've written you know, yeah. what will become you know the greatest plays of huh, your generation. What do you do for an encore? Exactly. Yeah. Well, there's I, no. I encore. go to the pub. I get an ale and I kick my feet up and say, "That's it." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and to his credit, you know, he's a novelist and his novels are amazing. But I mean, nothing in my, in my mind has ever compared to just the 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 sheer breadth of brilliance on display in Sandman. It's, it's really, it's astounding how good it is. And, and I love that it inspired other people. I mean, it really, I mean, the, the whole, you know, goth movement glommed mm -hmm. onto it and, uh, you know, we had a million girls dressing like death forever. And, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's such an amazing work. And, you know, he recently did a six issue mini series, Sandman Overture mm -hmm. kind of, you know, revisiting it basically it tells the story of what leads into Sandman one, how, why is he so vulnerable that he gets captured? And so we've gotten some new content over the years, but it's really, you know, it's just a, such a staggeringly good book. And then I think this is a, an amazing version of this particular issue. I wish they had gotten to do more. Uh, I would have liked to have seen animation wise, how they did the battle between Sandman and Dr. Destiny. Oh, absolutely. That would have been amazing. But I mean, I, I I don't. If you're not familiar with Sandman, folks, first of all, shame on you, because the whole world should be. I, and I'm not saying that like in any hyperbole. The whole world really should be able to read Sandman and experience it. But this is one of those comics that has endured for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And you know. I mean, I know we say that a lot about other things like, oh, you know, Watchmen's never been out of print and Dark Knight Returns has never been out of print and on and on. But at the same time, Watchmen aside, not everything that has stayed in print and been recirculated has the same level of impact that Sandman does. Sandman is one of those things that will resonate 
with every generation that reads it. Mm -hmm. You know, not everyone will get the same thing out of Death of Superman or Dark Knight Returns or uh, the Venom saga or anything like that. You know, most of those are like little nuggets of time and just, you know, re-examined by everyday comic fan. Sandman is something that transcends the medium. You know, as, as we've said, people who never read comics and will never read any other comics will read every page of Sandman front mm -hmm. and back. They would be perfect for watching this fan film. And, God, I mean, there's just so much I want to say and so much I can't say. Well, I just think it's it's they capture the, the the brilliance of the film is they capture the claustrophobic fear of that of that issue, mm -hmm. and they they capture the wrong place, wrong time fear that we all have, right? Like the we could be living our lives, we could be living them great, we could be making great decisions, we could be really good people, but if we are in the wrong place at the wrong time, none of that matters, and and so there's real horror and real terror in that. And they capture that really well. And then I think the what what puts it over the top is the animation sequence. Is they you know they really show where this could have gone. So I would I would recommend this film highly to anybody who has read the comic and has a stomach for it. I would not recommend it <laughs> to somebody <laughs> just skimming the internet, going, "Oh, I've always heard Sandman's good. Let me peek in and see what this is," because it's disturbing. Yeah. Uh, and it reminds me that the British call fish sticks fish fingers. Which grosses me out in theory, but grosses me out even more after watching this episode. <laughs> and so, you know, but I am looking forward to. I, I'm, I'm, I have trepidation about the Sandman series on on Netflix. I'm looking forward to it. Netflix tends to do things really well. I mean, they, you know, they've adapted other things. I, they adapted. Um, I don't know your if your kids are into the Heartstopper graphic novel series, like every other kids in the world my daughter's obsessed with them. No, I they did a Heartstopper series, which was really good. And uh, they've done other adaptations, which are really good. But but I'm just a little worried about the ability to adapt it, except just knowing that Gaiman is is very highly involved with it makes me hopeful. And then also coming off of Amazon's Good Omens that's series. Where, yeah, that's where I was I, about to go. I was like, Gaiman was highly involved yep. in Good Omens, and he swears it is like the the perfect adaptation of everything that was written down. So Well, Good Omens, I, I devoured it. It's my. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I bought it when it came out. I have it. I have an autographed copy of it. I read it every few years. I find it just as charming and funny as I, you know, as ever. And the adaptation of it was brilliant. I mean, it was brilliant. And I'm super excited because they're doing season two, and the and season one is the entire book. There is no sequel, and so this will all be new material in that universe, which is really exciting. But it gives me hope because it says, well, if Gaiman's that involved with Good Omens and they nail it like that then they'll probably nail Sandman. So, you know, and it's been, what, 30 years of promise of, of well, over 30 years of, of a Sandman movie or a Sandman series. Even Tarantino mm -hmm. was, was like, Guillermo del Toro was going to direct a Sandman movie once. Tarantino was going to direct a Sandman movie once. I mean, every major director in, in Hollywood has been attached to Sandman at some point. I'm glad they're not doing a movie. You cannot capture this book in a, in a movie fully. I'm glad they're doing a series. Yeah, it, it's definitely meant to be told over long form. Mm -hmm. And this fan film is a good example of that because you kind of couldn't get it more right than they did. But our, you know, our one complaint is it's incomplete. Right. Yeah. Th this is this is like if you picked up, you know, the first Star Wars movie and it says <laughs> Episode Four, and you're like, okay, well, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And then like somehow it just cut off like after they meet Han and Chewie. Or actually, I th I think the <laughs> Another better example would be if you come in right when he meets Obi Wan, and the movie ends with the burning bodies of Uncle <laughs> Owen and Amberu, and then you're like, and it's just like end, and you're like, wait, what? That's that's more what the feeling of this is like because it's so dark and, and disturbing. <laughs> Why do I get the feeling that in your universe, Obi Wan just like murdered them while you weren't looking? Oh yeah, yeah, fully. <laughs> Yeah, he, play, he he frames the stormtroopers, but there's some you know there's some pent up rage there. Yeah, they're 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 done. They're crispy. So, I, but but I mean, look, man, I appreciate you you sharing this with me. I I also had trepidation about watching it because it's such a creepy story, but it was really well done, and the the 
I didn't realize it was so recent. The you know the cast, the crew, the creators deserve a ton of credit because this is like I said the best fan film I've ever seen. And the only one I was able to uh, track down, let's see what they're doing now, is Story Sarah's, and uh, she still works in uh, media, but she, I don't know, she doesn't really act much. She's um, I believe she's an on air personality. Oh, like does the news and such. That's interesting. Imagine your local newscaster was also in this short film. Yeah. Or she's even better. She's like the weather person. (laughs) There's a storm front moving in that'll stab your eyes out. Oh, goodness. (laughs) That'd be creepy. Oh. In fact, yeah. But yeah, I mean, they're like, I I couldn't have imagined covering this with anyone else, Sean. This is, uh, I mean, this, like I said, this has been on my to watch list for a long time. Mm -hmm. And and I'm so glad we finally got to cover it. Me too. Me too. And this is a, we've had a varied, this is my, what, my third episode? Uh, yes. My third fan film. And it's been pretty varied. We had the goofy but fun Italian X-Men film. And then we had, what was our second one? Um, oh, we did the, um, the Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that was delightful, actually. That, that, well, you know what? I take it. The, the Sandman Ooh, those are my two favorite fan films because the Sherlock Holmes <laughs> one is so quaint and charming that it's hard. Actually, okay, I'm going to shout out to your listeners. If you watch the Sandman episode and you listen to the podcast, go back and do the Sherlock Holmes one right, Holmes one right after as a palate cleaner, as a, as a palate cleanser. Yes. And, and just to get an injection of charming and adorable after that very, very dark Sandman story. Yeah, because it is just so – it's it's so pure. Yeah, it's really – it is – it's awesome. Oh, and I, I double check uh, story. Saris uh, reports for uh, the IHF Hockey Federation. Oh my God! Wow. Okay, so we we weren't far off. It's like it, you know, that's a that's definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm I wonder if she ever drops I I H F. Sorry, I, I wonder like if she it. ever drops anything from the movie in there. If she's ever like you know, and the you know. Hartford Whalers stabbed the eyes out of the you know <laughs> Vancouver Canucks tonight. Oh. oh, so I mean, I, I think we've pretty well covered it. Yeah, yeah, this I think is, we're good. I mean, I like I said, highly recommended, just with a caveat. Yeah, yeah. it's extremely well done. It's best for um, Sandman fans. Yes, and doubly best for Sandman fans that can stomach the content. Well, and like swimming, don't eat an hour mm. before watching this. Yeah, especially not you know. Fish fingers, steak fingers, <laughs> chicken fingers, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. lady fingers, anything, yeah. tiramisu. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically, you know, nothing. <laughs> Maybe a salad. Like salad. There you go. All right. So before we get out of this basement, Sean, do let people know where they can find you. Uh, well, thanks again for having me. I, I always love being on the show, and, and you always introduce me to really cool stuff. Uh, I can be found on the Pulp to Pixel Podcast Network, where I co-host the Never Ending Reading Pile with my buddy Greg Arujo. It's basically nostalgia goggles on 11. We pick an issue or short story arc from character or book we love, and we talk about it and everything around it. And so if you're a collector and you've been collecting since the 80s, you would love this show. Uh, I'm also co-host of the Bat Pod with Bill Beer, and that's a modern show where we cover all the new Bat books as they come out each week and month. That's a lot of fun. Keeps me plugged into current books. And there is no better line of books right now than the Bat books at DC. They're they're incredible. So, uh, and then I'm, I also co-host the um, World on Fire All Star Squadron podcast with Billy Delicious and Martin Gray, and that is a ton of fun. Billy was nice enough to invite Martin and I on as as kind of rotating co-hosts so if you're a fan of the all-star squadron that's a good show as well all righty <sighs> well it's gonna be kind of sad to see this basement go but yep all right sean let, let's head out all right wait wait wait, wait clinton yeah. <laughs> clinton Clint, i'm losing you clinton Clint, well, it's getting sean, fuzzy it's sean getting fuzzy. wait up sean <laughs> sean come back sean Sean, uh, of course, it really was too good to be true. It was all a dream. And I'm still buried under all of Jason's old tax papers. Laurel, Laurel, come do some filing. Laurel. Do you remember your first comic book? Do you remember the first time you held a cover in your hand and you flipped the pages? You read the adventures of these amazing heroes 
and you really fell in love with the medium, the first time you bonded a character to a team, to a company, and you knew, yep, I'm in this for life. Well, so do we. So join us on the never-ending reading pile from the Pulp to Pixel Podcast Network, where we proudly don our nostalgia goggles, we dive into our favorite comics, our favorite eras, our favorite characters, our favorite creators, and we just bask in the glory that is being a comic book collector. Come join us and help us chip away at the never-ending reading pile. Hey, everybody. Thanks for sticking with me. This is, of course, the feedback portion of the show. Yes, I am out from underneath all that mountain of paperwork, finally. Laurel did come down. She totally you know, dug me out. All the while, they explained to me that she doesn't work here. Um, I'll have to ask Jared and Jason about that, because surely she's just telling me stuff, trying to get me mad and and upset and ignore all the pain I was in from all the papers. Anyway, we got some like shares, all that fun stuff for the last episode, which came out way back when, before I got buried under paperwork. Which, as a reminder, last episode we covered the Scream fan film, or the uh, a proof of concept anyway, for the Scream fan film. Red Right Hand from Trigger Mortis Productions. That episode got like, shares, retweets, and all the social media love from Rick Heineken, Delvin Williams, Laurel, Christados, Gene Hendricks, Saul Lerman, Mike Zakowski, Monthly Monday Movie Muckabout, Kathy Bright, Professor Frenzy, Jared Albrecht, and Chris at BTO and Back Books. If I missed anybody, let me know. I have kind of had a little bit of a spotty connection and may have missed quite a bit of feedback, actually. However, I know for a fact I got an email from Laurel, who said, Hi, Clinton. Catching up on lots of episodes, so here's a little feedback for them. Jim Fanfilm was excellent. I think you mean truly outrageous, Laurel. But, you know, I love the hair, makeup, and costuming. I wonder if they were able to buy those wigs already colored. Uh, I'm going to say probably so, Laurel, because cosplayers definitely know how to cosplay. <laughs> the acting was really spot on, too. I liked that the film paid homage to the cartoon and poked a little fun at it all at the same time. Having the Baroness as the ultimate bad guy was wild. Also wondered who made the doll that was Kimber's as a machine child. Or that was Kimber, okay. It's small details like these that make for a great fan film. Batman Death Wish was good, but I felt the actors were a bit stiff in those costumes. There is a fine line between being comic book accurate and being live action practical in costuming. Boy, you said it. You and Kathy were wondering about the name of the film. There was a time in the comics where Cassandra Cain Batgirl struggled with a death wish. She was taking big risks and allowing herself to get injured. In this film, Cassandra is allowing herself to get shot during fights in an attempt to become so incapacitated she would no longer be of use to Ivy. You could also argue that she was allowing the injuries as punishment for the bad deeds she's doing as Ivy's puppet. Either or would be considered having a death wish. Thanks for mentioning the Cassandra Came Batgirl podcast. Well, I will mention it again because Laurel brings her knowledge from being on the Cassandra Came Batgirl podcast. She continues with, I'm actually glad the quality of the Lobo video wasn't great. I didn't want to see the killing of the elves. The sound was disturbing enough. However, I did chuckle when one elf did an homage to the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> That's true. Uh, the Santa actor did a good job of switching from Mafia voice Santa to cheerful giver of presents Santa and back again. The interview with the red right hand folks was fun. I managed to watch the original Scream on video, but I really dislike slasher movies. Still, I enjoyed the interview and how enthusiastic they all were about doing the best production possible. Thanks for all your episodes and the great guests you've had to discuss each of these fan films. I may get behind on listening, but I really enjoy the show. Best wishes. Well, Laurel, as you can tell, I get behind on putting episodes out, so if you're behind on listening, that probably works out best for both of us. Oh, if I missed any feedback, please bring it to my attention, because like I said, I have spotty records right now. 
I'm not sure if I have, you know, just completely missed it in there somewhere. Uh, and as far as guests for the show, like Laurel mentioned, I do have guests. They are all wonderful guests. And if any of you listeners want to be a wonderful guest on the show and possibly get me out of this basement, I would love to have you on here. So all you have to do is contact me. You can find me on Twitter at Fridays underscore fan. Or you can send an email to contact at longboxcrusade.com. I'm sure Pat, Jared, Jason, Delvin, one of those guys will forward it to me somehow. Probably with, you know, with it printed out and wrapped around a rock that they tossed through the door or something. So, thank you again for uh, bearing with me. Thank you for listening for all this. Thank you so much, Crusader Club members, for getting us up past 35 Crusader Club members. That, that was wonderful. And this is my episode thanks to all of you. So, hopefully I will not have nightmares from that fan film. Just the usual nightmares of being trapped down in this basement. But, you know, th th those are, I I'm pretty used to those by now. So, hopefully this entertained everyone. I don't know it entertained me. And I look forward to all of you joining me again for another Fan Film Friday. Today you can take your telephone, your, your, your cell phone, and you can make a movie on that. And if it's a really cool movie that's funny and it's dramatic or whatever, you can post it on YouTube. If you want to make films and you want to tell stories, you can do it. obsessed with film and you love to tell stories and you love working in that medium, uh, then uh, that'll give you the strength to be persistent. Yeah, I'm totally going to put the sound effect in, not myself. <laughs> All right. Huh? Uh, of course. It's all a dream. I knew it was too good to be true. When you say it's all a dream, do you see Bobby from Dallas showering in the other room? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a very specific reference, but I feel like a lot of our listeners will get that. Good morning. <laughs> the greatest cop out.